If I hadn't become an actor or a director of films, I guess I would have liked to become a race car driver. There is a difference to most sports, maybe in a way that drivers are wired, slightly insane. You've got to have a bit of a screw loose to start getting in racing cars and motorbikes. It's a very extreme way of life. We all love the sports personalities who go a little bit off-piste. Oh! <laughs> want to drink it, not bar for you. Most men in those days would have liked to be Barry or James. I grab that cigarette off you. Most women wanted them. I'm going to rip your... Hey, hey, hey. We just don't get on. Be careful, son. <laughs> it's not an act. The objective should be to build better motor cars. Everyone that has ever driven for him became world champion. Have you had many tips from the big brother? Uh, plenty. I need to get my buzz out of it, and buzz is racing motorbikes and winning. Anyone that's at that race sharp end has to have that single-mindedness. I'm going to bloody race again. There's no reason why it wasn't my fault I fell off. You've got to have the mental determination to beat all the others, come what may. They like to go to the outer edge and dance around and then try and come back. And sometimes it doesn't happen. Completely back control. Oh, limit hits the limit! The beauty and brevity of a life lived on the limit. Death comes as well, someday. What are your immediate plans now? I should be getting drunk. Let's start with wheels. Two wheels, finally in Britain, Evil Knievel. How many of us would even attempt or even think about doing a daredevil stunt like this? And here he goes. It's full speed and he's rising up the ramp now. And he's made it, no, he's crashed on the run in. People went to watch Evil Knievel jump over buses at Wembley and then jump the Grand Canyon because they probably thought he was going to fail, didn't they? They're hauling him to his feet. Well, he's certainly going out the hero's way. I have the most respect for motorcycle riders because, for me, they are the ultimate. In my day, if someone said, what do you do for a living, and you said, well, I'm a motorcycle racer, they'd kind of grab their kids and handbags and run away. 1970s Britain. Burdened by strikes and power cuts needed cheering up. The era saw the emergence of the sporting maverick and motorcycling's leading man. Barry Sheen was the ultimate hero. Moving on the Queen's Highway. He was a George Best of biking. Unbelievable bike racer, brave as anything, party boy, girls, travel, drink, booze, winning. Cheeky, driven, played on the arse. Take your breath away, but I Even my kids, you know, in the 20s, motorcycle rider will go by us in the car and it's like, oh, who do you think you are, Barry Sheen? It's just something to do because I love motorcycles and uh, I was quite content to come and park my bike in amongst all these guys here and, and just watch the race. And I never ever thought I'd start racing for one thing and I never ever thought I'd be world champion. That was the farthest thing from my mind. He's one of those guys that just had a, a magnetism around him. He was like an, an aura. It was impossible to dislike Barry. He was such an endearing super bloke. I really want to go out and make my mark in the motorcycle racing world. And I don't want to make any marks on the circuit at the same time. But young Mr Sheen did crash. It was one of the best things to happen to him. Barry had an absolutely dreadful accident in 1975. became famous sort of overnight for this Daytona crash. It sort of put him in the public eye. Typically, Barry, he was giving interviews from his hospital bed, and that's when the public really latched on to everything that he was and everything that he represented. I remember exactly what happened. It was doing about 170 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, the, the back wheel just locked solid. And I thought, God, going this fast, there's no way I can afford to lose it, you know? And it just completely went out of control and spat me over the top sort of thing. You know, I was rolling, and I could feel all the skin coming off my shoulder and that. And then when I stopped, 
I was sort of lying down and I thought, Christ, I'm still alive. You know, it didn't kill me, it didn't even knock me out. And I kind of sort of went to move and get up and then I looked down and this leg was right angles poking underneath the other one. First time I ever saw him, I was outside a nightclub and he was on crutches and I'd seen him on this documentary. I was in my agents the next day and she was saying, we need to get some more photos together. And I said, well, I've thought of an idea of photos with this guy. He's got these leathers and didn't never seen leathers before or anything. And that was it, really. And we hit it off straight away. The girl in Barry Sheen's life is Stephanie McLean. Both of you are perfect material for gossip columns. Do either of you resent that? I don't, it all depends on what they write, obviously. At first, you know, you get a bit upset about it, but you get used to getting over it. You know. When Barry Sheen came back to Brands Hatch in October for the last race of the season, it was a chance for British fans to pay homage to a new world superstar. He loved it. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Among Sheen's rivals this weekend, Steve Parrish, an old friend who still has enormous faith in Sheen's ability. What sort of special qualities do you think he's got as a rider? I think probably determination is one of the things, and he likes to prove everyone wrong. At the time, he was absolutely brilliant. Sheen went from that crumpled heap at Daytona to 500cc world champion in just over a year. He was a star doing it his way. By the time of the Swedish Grand Prix, with three races still to go, Barry had won the World Championship. And because they were not going to pay him enough starting money to appear in the other three races, he said, all right, I'm not going to take part. He stuck two fingers up to the organizers and uh, stayed at home. 1976 and 77, he was the best in the world. He beat all the, the people, the established stars. If you're a good rider, you've got fans and people to come and watch you and they'd tell you how good you were and then you'd be standing on the podium and then you'd get the prettiest girl in the paddock and then you'd get paid to do it and then someone would want to give you a free car and you're living in this amazing world which is giving you so much feedback. I know what I can do, I know I can deliver. I don't care whether I'm not going to conform. I'm going to do what I do with a smile on my face and I'm going to enjoy every single moment. You had to work the press as well, all the journalists around in those days. Love Barry Sheen. Let's hope you bring the championship back, Barry. Well, if I don't, it won't be for the lack of trying, I can promise you. Hello, Dickie. He had that amazing ability to embrace everyone around him. Hello, Dickie. And back to Dickie in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Barry. How are you, my son? Good luck. I think that was the start of sports people yeah, becoming like, like pop stars and yeah. actors. Former Beatle George Harrison is a fan and a friend. It was glamorous. It was, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll at the time. It was the swinging 70s. There is an element of maverick in motor soccer racing because it is abnormal. It's the old cliche, it's a drug, and it is really because there is so much satisfaction that comes from pushing yourself to that limit. I think that's why quite a few of us like flying as well. In Silverstone, then. It's, I've had some great races around here, but unfortunately I fell off while leading the British Grand Prix in 1977. And then I also found Barry on the track smashed to bits in 1982, where it nearly, um, nearly did him in. He came over a blind brow going immensely quickly. This was all that remained of Sheen's Yamaha after that dreadful accident. He crested a rise at about 175 miles an hour, hit a fallen bike, and his mangled body was found 300 yards further down the track. Both his legs were absolutely shattered, and when he went to hospital, they were talking very seriously about amputating them. Sheen's legs now are held together by two plates and 27 screws. That was his, his thing, you know, the bionic man. Just three weeks and two days after his horrendous crash at Silverstone, he's out of hospital and quick to reject the first suggestions that he might not race again. I'm going to bloody race again. There's no reason. It wasn't my fault I fell off. Barry got back on the bike, but the injuries would add up. He never won another world championship event. But that maverick streak was turning Sheen from racer into revolutionary. 
And I counted about 24 mates of ours that died over that period of probably seven or eight years. How do you feel right now about the way your career is going? Um, off. <laughs> he didn't want to die, simple as that. You know, I'm not going to stick my neck out going crazy in the rain or in the drizzle. You know, because there's no, you don't know where the limit is in the rain. He was powerful in the industry. He steered a lot of what went on, on getting the tracks safer. People like myself, we didn't have that sort of horsepower and we didn't dare do it. He'd just stand up against them saying, you can't do that, we're not doing it. Come on guys, we're all not riding here. And if Barry Sheen's not riding, we're not riding. So he had that much power. I think there's a lot to be said to being who you want to be and not being too frightened about not conforming. Sheen's nonconformity would have repercussions for the Isle of Man TT, a race that's always lived a maverick existence. He had something to do with the TT losing its world championship status, which I think is absolutely right. I don't think you should be forced to go to the TT, and the TT's become bigger and better now because you're not forced to it, you choose to go to it. How does it feel to be the fastest man ever around the Isle? The Isle of Man TT is the biggest test for man and machine. Well, I'm probably not wired up, maybe even the same as the rest of the racers. It's an honour of your dad. It is, and I hope he's proud. I live my life on the edge, and if I'm tricked tomorrow, sure. The crack was good in the way. It is motorcycling's most notorious race, the Isle of Man TT. 141 racers have lost their lives on the twisting road circuit, but the ultimate challenge offers the greatest thrill. 50,000 fans have crammed into the island. The Isle of Man TT, without doubt, is the biggest test for man and machine. The circuit itself is unique. TT is still the Mount Everest of motorcycling. Nearly 38 miles long, there are bends where speeds are as low as 10 miles an hour and straights that are 190. Skill, bravery, determination. It draws riders from all over the world. They talk of the fascination of its special challenge. We talk about the knife edge of sport. There is none sharper than the TT. For the riders, it's stamina, mental and physical stamina. At these speeds, there's no forgiving a loss of concentration. And maintaining concentration for two hours under this sort of physical pressure takes riders of exceptional caliber. When you talk about road racing guys, even I, who used to do it, look at them and think, <laughs> what are they up to? How does it feel to be the fastest man ever around the island? Oh, it's great right now. It's a quick place. The quiet Ulsterman, Joey Dunlop, still holds the record for TT victories. King of the mountain, 26 times. And it was all his own work. Joey liked to get his hands dirty. He liked to not just work on the bikes at the meeting, but prepare them all in his workshop and look after them. Leathers round his waist, and he'd be changing the main jets on them, changing the gear in, covered in oil and grease. You'd always see Joey wandering around with a fag hanging out of his mouth, covered in oil all over his hands, and uh, happy as Larry just getting stuck in to get the best out of the machine. Wasn't really interested in the PR side. It was purely about fettling with the bikes and, of course, winning. Look how smooth this man rides. Joey Dunlop, a very, very smooth and stylish rider. But someone came along today and said, here's a works contract. Is it something you might grab at? Uh, probably would be right enough. There's a lot of pressure on you when you're riding through the best firms. But you would like to prove yourself against Sheen and Roberts and people like that? <laughs> uh, if you keep the them on right enough, I might. <laughs> <laughs> and here are the Dunlop brothers on the last lap. Younger brother Roberts was the biggest threat to Joey's road racing dominance. In a sport of dynasties, the Dunlops ruled. What about this young brother of yours? Has he got what it takes? Oh, he's got a bit anyway. I've watched him at Timothy. He goes well. Have you had many tips from the big brother? Ah, uh, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favourite rider? Oh, uh, he's, he's got to think about it, Joey. <laughs> uh, 
Robert was very good on the short circuit as well as on the road racing side. He had some massive injuries and some great comebacks uh, and was very successful even after his big injuries. Dunlop leads out, Dunlop's a leader. Oh, and Lemon hits Dunlop and takes him out. Unbelievable, Dunlop is stunned in the road. I grew up with him and the smashes he took and stuff, you know, he was a very inspirational person to, to look up from the crashes he took, to get up from it again and to work back from it. And, you know, he was always a fighter. My dad hadn't a lot of money either them days and he, he just worked like a dog, you know, just to go motorbike racing. You know, once I get injured, I just really, uh, the drive and the buzz that I get out of motorcycle racing, I just, it drives me on to get fit again, to be able to do it again. Coming back from this was Robert's greatest battle. Somehow he survived when his rear wheel failed at the 1994 TT. Somehow his desire to race again was even stronger. My wrist, I have to get an operation done on it. It's, it doesn't work at all. It's a drop wrist, you call it. They're going to transfer some muscles from the front to the back to get the wrist to work. And then uh, take a bit of bone off my hip and put it in my leg and try and get that sort of out as well. You know, I hope to be back on a bike, you know, as, obviously as soon as possible. When you get something that, with that much passion, it's, it's hard to replace that sort of thing. And, you know, and my dad definitely gave us a bit of an encouragement to go, go racing motorbikes. 13-year-old Michael Dunlop was under the watchful eye of his famous father, Robert. Michael has been racing miniature bikes for the past couple of years and was delighted to be out on the track. I felt very good. It was experience and I just wanted to go out and see if I could try one to five a couple of years time. That's my first ever bike actually, it was a motocrosser my dad got me. Michael Dunlop in particular is a proper maverick. Hoping maybe to get out of the Northwest 200 next year or the year after, that'll be, see what I can do there and see how short circuits go, see if I can go over to England or run and see if anyone will take me on. That's the 2009 TT one on bike. That's my first stock bike. On the roads, we've all seen how good Michael is. His success speaks for itself, you know. That's my second TT. My third TT, fourth TT, fifth TT, sixth TT's there too. Seventh, eighth, ninth, and that's a tenth, and then that's eleventh, so I've got to keep all the ferns. Success. I'm there to enjoy the buzz that I get. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing, not there for the money, the fame. I'm just there for that buzz. People keep in me. Why are you saying ferns are dirty? I'm like, because I ran my balls off for six laps, that's why, you know. <laughs> Keeping that sort of thing, you know, you can give me enough money, you know, I've been offered five grand for them, sort of bike fair and stuff, and it doesn't interest me, you know. He'll say what he thinks, he doesn't care if he upsets anyone. All he knows is he wants the best motorcycle he can possibly get, put him on it, fire him off down towards the traffic lights at Glen Crutchery Road, and then he's got a smile on his face. Like, as the youngest person ever, I won around the Isle of Man, and I love the place. I think it's an absolutely fantastic place, and I think all real road racers do love it. You know, I think it's the, the place that stands out for everybody. Michael's not fearless. He knows his limitations, and that limitation might be a little bit further than the next guy. For sure, he'll push, and he'll probably push past the boundaries of most other riders on the grid, and they're fully aware of that. Uh, but again. That's why he's so attractive, not just to other teams, but to the public watching. Oh, what a massive oh, moment! I sometimes get a buzz from crashing, you know what I mean? I enjoy the getting up and that, that was close enough today. We'll, we'll, we'll not try that one again, you know what I mean? And sometimes you need that, you know what I mean? Obviously, you don't go out to crash, you don't want to, but I don't mind putting myself into positions that if I have to go over the edge, I'll, I'll try it and see if it works or not. I am a bit of a fruit lip. I have no problem at all, you know what I mean, admitting that, you know. And I think everybody around me knows me well enough to know that, you know, I'm probably not wired up, maybe even the same as the rest of the racers. This is a 99 TSR. I won road racing championships with it, and then William decided to ride it, so he has read it now, and he's won a couple of championships on it. William Dunlop has the same family flair and independent streak. We're two completely different characters. On the track, he's got different styles, I've got different styles, and he's a good, strong wee rider, William, you know, and there's not a lot of people you can honestly say they've got what it takes, but he's got it. 
I think people should have a choice for what they do in life instead of being told what they do. I think you know, everybody knows the rest. They know before they go out what's what what's possible or happening, and you know I don't think that right should be taken away from them. Thursday, May the fifteenth, a practice session at the Northwest Two Hundred. Robert crashed at Mather's Cross, the same place his brother-in-law died almost 30 years before. He was travelling at 160 miles per hour when his bike seized, throwing him over the handlebars. My dad always said this is a selfish sport, so it is. it's something you can't give up and when he goes out there he knows with, with what has happened now that he'd be left, you know, three kids and, and a wife, but at the end, of, you know, it's his life and, you know, he enjoyed it. In its long history, the North West 200 has had many moments to remember, but none to compare with Saturday. Less than 48 hours after the death of their father, William and Michael took part in the 250 race, with Michael incredibly winning in dramatic style and dedicating it to the memory of his father. And I got up that morning and we just decided to, to go racing motorbikes and we landed to the North West and... I think there was a bit of a row then too that they didn't want us racing and we weren't allowed to race and they weren't going to let us race and I said, well, we're going anyway. I just wanted to do it, darling. That was that. The first lot had just gone to go out and come in and last lot I said, that's it, can't do it. Like, I, can't, I can't go home and celebrate, you know, I just... Oh, we can, Michael. Of course not, but the very fact that you took part, uh, that's an honour of your dad. It is, and I hope he's proud. Robert Dunlop was 47 when he died, after a crash during practice in Northern Ireland at the Northwest 200. Death comes as all. Someday, I'd rather die doing something I enjoy than being hit by a car by somebody just going past. I live my life on the edge, and if I'm took tomorrow, sure, the crack was good in the way. Joey Dunlop was 48 when he too was killed in action. I'm never out here, you know what I mean? If I'm out working, back in the evenings in here, I'm trying to put a 325 horsepower engine into my lawnmower to race. This is my baby here now. This is Mark II Escort. <laughs> it's good condition because the last time I had it, I think we crashed it, so I had to paint it. <laughs> Your Barry Sheens, they love to be in the limelight. But, you know, as far as all of the Dunlops, in my experience, quite the opposite, really. They're quite happy, happy to shy away and go and enjoy their own thing. She's got everything you want in a, in a, in a Mark II, you know, and uh, you know, you're sitting there with 300 ponies. We've seen how it electrifies Michael looking at his rally car. He sounds more excited the thought of driving his Mark II Escort than he does winning a senior TT. Old car, new engine, rear wheel drive, mm. horsepower. And an edit. Next, we're heading back to a golden age when Formula One was fun. So if I say shucks and and all that sort of stuff, Oh, James Hunt. Can we rub that out? We can. <laughs> to say that James was a playboy was a masterpiece of understatement. People really like the idea of being associated with something that's independent and doesn't owe anything to anyone. People like Chapman pushed everything to the absolute limit. We live in an age of speed. Cars, ships, aeroplanes, even man himself are constantly being urged faster and ever faster. I don't think there's anything more exhilarating than sitting there at 200 miles an hour plus, you know, a couple of centimetres away from the guy next to you. You also know that you're about to go into the corner together and maybe only one of you is going to come out the other end. There's a little bit of a thing inside you that actually has a bit of fun with that. It's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm ready. Are you going to come with me or not? You're honing all your control inputs to the car of steering, braking, throttle, to just control that car on the absolute limit. You then throw in 24 other nutters. It's just so invigorating. There's nothing else like it. And that's the sort of driving that James Hunt hopes will bring him his second Grand Prix victory of the season. If you could have been a Formula One driver in any era, you would want to be James Hunt in that era, would you not? Oh, James Hunt. 
you associate James with massive amount of ability, you associate him with being a world champion, you associate him with being a fantastic British racing driver, and you associate him with being a playboy. To say that James was a playboy was a masterpiece of understatement. Did you give me a cigarette? Can I grab that cigarette off you? Thanks. James drank like a fish, smoked like a chimney, womanised like there was no tomorrow. He transcended the sport. He was someone who would make it onto the front and back pages of the paper. James, how much does this victory mean to you? Nine points, $20,000 and a lot of happiness. Charming, charismatic, uh, unbelievably determined, arrogant, rude, overbearing, unbearable. Do you just want to get a level? Get a level there. So if I say shut all that sort of stuff. Oh dear. Well, I'll, well, I'll cancel it then. Can we rub that out? We can. <laughs> I always think about James as a, like a golden retriever, you know, because always with this floppy hair, he was always happy and he was like all over the place. I got out of trouble completely. I never hit anybody. I stopped to the left and came apart into it. His character sort of just consumed you. Wherever he went, it kind of commanded attention. And, and maybe that was in a bad way as well as a good way. If ever I got irritated with James, and I used to get very irritated with James, I always reminded myself that there was a very nice bloke hiding inside. Ten minutes before the race, he might have had a good girl in some caravan somewhere, but would you not? Would you not, if you were a single man in Formula One back in those days, you know, be a bit of a lad? Well, I think you would. James had an embroidered thing on his overalls which said sex, the breakfast of champions. Nowadays, it couldn't possibly happen. On the last lap, the crowd rises to James, a tribute to the first English victory in the British Grand Prix for 18 years. He was a ferocious competitor, very aggressive, very fast, and sometimes if it didn't come off, he would get violent out of the car. There's a famous case where he collided with another driver, got out and punched the guy in the face. And then uh, at a Grand Prix once, he did the same thing to a marshal. James just knocked him down. And it wasn't because he was innately aggressive or unpleasant. It was just because he was still in the race as far as he was concerned. Hunt's precocious talent needed a backer. It came in the shape of a man who put the maverick into Lord of the Manor, the third Baron of Hesketh. Well, I first became interested in cars when I was conscious of the existence of cars. James got into Formula One in very exceptional circumstances. I don't think James was the obvious bloke that a sponsor or a team would have gone for in those early days. Had it not been for Alexander Hesketh getting him into Formula One in the first place, who knows whether he would have ever done it. Every time we've had a disaster, we've moved up a formula rather than down to try and start again. This may be a rather eccentric way of going, but it seems to have worked. That was... You know, planets aligning for James. And had he gone to a different team, you know, had he gone to Ferrari, that might have been knocked out of him. And he might have been a very different man, who knows, but thank God he didn't. Lord Alexander Hesketh was young, portly, outgoing, to put it mildly, and had uh, an enormous amount of money. And it was a sort of uh, jolly wheeze to have a Formula One team. If I had sponsors, it wouldn't really be my car. It would be the property of... I don't know who a tobacco company or an oil company. We had this small little team that developed into something that, uh, you know, became quite strong on the race circuit in terms of performance and results, but done with a little playboy sort of uh, swagger. What is really wonderful is to see that people really like the idea of it and of being associated with something that's independent and doesn't owe anything to anyone. They're on their own and, you know, it's, it's nice to see a small outfit doing so well up to now. What it gets has a, an atmosphere of the old type Grand Prix teams and uh, I think that anything truly British deserves supporting. For sure there was a seriousness behind everything they did but at the same time it had this kind of uh, this gloss across it. Food for everybody, champagne by the Crayfield. The Hesketh charisma is very much in evidence. His Lordship and the rest of them were there with a Rolls Royce with the boot lid open and on it was champagne and caviar and all the fine things of life. And I thought, well, this is a bit of a rum do. It's, uh, it's not the Formula One that I know. It's this boisterous approach that has won frosty looks from some, but it's also brought glamour and style to the otherwise basic pit road. 
Formula One was uh, a bit more tolerant of oddball in that day than it would be now. And I can't see the Hesketh attitude getting anywhere these days. More's the pity. Hesketh Racing aimed to be on that winner's rostrum during the 70s, winning for themselves and for Britain. They won the Dutch Grand Prix before the champagne and the money dried up. But Hunt had proved himself, securing a career-defining move to McLaren. When James became world champion in 1976, that's when Britain became interested in Formula One. It was because of the publicity that James generated for himself and through himself for the sport that it became more and more popular. Hunt's star burnt itself out after that brilliant season. But another British original had also been transforming Formula One. When Colin Chapman founded Team Lotus in the 1950s, the established order were in for a shock. The driver has a feeling whenever he's employed by Lotus that uh, he has a distinctive chance of being a winner. An engineer and inventor, Chapman's ideas for car design and technology left the rest a long way behind. Where would you expect and hope him to be on the grid? Oh, on pole position, I hope, yes. Lotus boss Colin Chapman had led his team to six previous constructors' titles. Four drivers had become world champion with Chapman. Nothing gave him greater pleasure than to make Andretti champion number five. We're going to really? save these. They're a little bit cured. Maybe we can get yeah. something out of them tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Chapman was a pioneer, and a lot of great technical innovations came from his drawing board. Innovation, I think, is the one word that you'd have to put against Colin Chapman. The level of performance that he managed to you know, get out of four wheels on a racing circuit was way beyond most. By 1978, Lotus had won six drivers' championships. The record speaks for itself as to what Colin Chapman has accomplished over the years with different drivers. I think everyone that has ever driven for him uh, somehow became world champion. The field lines up behind Andretti on the grid. His dominance of this season has been total, but has it been achieved through driving talent or through machinery? Britain's James Hunt. As far as drivers are concerned, there, there are probably, there's certainly 15 guys that you could put into a Lotus who would win the World Championship at the moment. Chapman would claim that there was no real new technique involved in the 79, but nevertheless, the car was reckoned to be a year or possibly two years ahead of the opposition. Collins achieved the standard which everyone else now has to try and get to as well, otherwise it's no contest. Uh, the car is so superior. It's been described as the most perfect racing car ever put together. Would you agree with that? The 79, I think, has achieved it in this particular era, but I think it started a new era, a new era of technology and a new era of attitudes towards what makes a racing car go well. Everybody out in Formula One who succeeds is, is there's a certain amount of risk taking involved and obviously people like Chapman pushed everything to the absolute limit. The chief advantage in Formula One design was to be gained through aerodynamics. He was the first one that really got interested in aerodynamics. He realized that if you put some wings on a car, the opposite of an aeroplane wing, it would push the car down to the ground in the same way as an aeroplane wing will lift the car off the ground. And that extra squash onto the tire would give more grip to the tyre and therefore you go more quickly round the corners. The principle involves using the air that passes underneath this car, channeling it through the side pods, trapping it with these reversible skirts and passing it out of the back in a manner in which uh, it beds the car down onto the track, so improving the traction and the road holding. But uh, with all these developments in modern motor racing, they're surrounded by protest and counter-protest from the sport's variety of governing bodies. Well, I try to keep clear of the political side as much as I can. I'm really concentrated on designing and running and racing the cars. There is quite a lot of uh, manoeuvring between the lawmakers and the adjudicating body and so on, but uh, I think Formula One should be a sport which is not only a, a competition between drivers, but also between manufacturers of cars, and the objective should be to build better motor cars and to help the evolution of the general production car. He set levels that nobody else had achieved. Yeah, I put him in the same category as a, a Jobs of Apple, you know, a Gates of Microsoft. 
that that's that's the kind of guy that you, you have to put him in in amongst because yes he was a genius there isn't a, a road car post-war that doesn't show some sign of his influence in design whether it's uh, suspension handling aerodynamics brakes i mean the man has just had the most incredible influence on motoring as a whole and the most visible and outward expression of it is his successes in motor racing we still see you know the name associated with parts on our cars today and like any self-respecting maverick colin chapman had his own very particular style he always had the polo neck shirt and the tweed jacket he always had the, that black cap you know whenever a lotus car won the race he would be there next to the guy with the checkered flag and fling the cap up into the air it was part of his signature there was a certain flamboyance about him and the way that he did things <laughs> Next, proof that on the track they're still flying the flag for independent thought. Oh, man, sideways! You know if you see a great big tall bloke on the dance floor? Oh, man, they just don't dance very well. He's a bit like out of a car. The line you walk between looking a genius and looking an idiot is very marginal. If you feel Formula One has got rather boring, fear not. Touring cars has always been about entertainment. It's brash, edgy, and it likes its drivers to express themselves. It's proper racing. Clearly recognisable cars, great overtaking. And there's a little bit of bump and a barge, you know, and that's healthy, and that's good. You'll have success ballast, you'll have reverse grids. They mix it all up, and that is all there to create action, and it works. Because of the nature of the racing, it is very close, very competitive. That's entertainment. It's honest, competitive motorsport. I really think the, the public get it, they like it, it's exciting. If I wasn't in it, I'd watch it. Jason's always had fantastic pace, fantastic speed, and very, very hungry. Uh, yeah, I think he is a maverick, definitely. Certainly, when I was a lot younger, you could argue say I was a bit of a lunatic. You know, I wouldn't have a risk gland and it wouldn't alert me to impending doom. We all know how he got his drive with Frank Williams and the Williams Renault team by literally sitting his car outside the Williams factory until he could hijack Frank Williams. That's the mark of somebody that wants it badly. I don't subscribe to. It's the taking part that matters. It just simply isn't. It's winning. That's why I've got more race wins than anyone by a country mile, and that's probably why I've got less championship wins than I should have. Third win in one day for Jason Plato. He's won a lot of races, but he's been in great cars to do that, so should he have won more? Yeah. Did he drop the ball on those occasions? Probably. And in the era of the sponsor-friendly soundbite comes a true rivalry. I've had some great battles with Matt. Yeah. And I've had some not so good ones with him. He's had a go at me on track and we've yinged and yanged back, but I know I've got under his skin. They genuinely dislike each other. <laughs> it's not an act. We just don't get on. He would rather anybody else win the championship, except me at some points. Matt, you said I wouldn't win. <laughs> That's Jason's nature. He'll have a go at anybody who gets on his nerves or has a go at him or criticises him or, or challenges him. For me, Matt's never been a great rival because I don't rate him that highly as a driver. I know it upsets him if I can beat him, and when I do beat him, he can't take it on board. They've made contact, Neil and Plato made contact there. They're still leaning on each other. He sees a manoeuvre and he's never on, but he'll have a go. If there's an opportunity there, I, you know, I want to grab it with both hands, and that's whether for a championship, a win, or just an overtaking manoeuvre on someone. Look, he's going to get back now. He's yeah. going to get back. He's returning the favour. Do you know if you see a great big tall bloke on the dance floor? Oh, man, they just don't dance very well. He's a bit like out of a car. The line you walk between looking a genius and looking an idiot is very marginal. Plato will do his utmost to defend from Matt Neal, but... Matt would just love it if he could put one over Plato here. Plato and Neil at Snetterton on the last lap, they both couldn't give a damn, so they were going to win by hook or by crook. And I could see 
through his rearview mirror. He was watching me, so I, I knew I got him rattled. Can Matt get a better exit? He's on the outside. And then I got a great run around the outside, and he just turned left halfway down the straight, straight into the side of my car. It's not a good place to have contact. Oh, Matt Neal sideways, championship leader in big trouble. So I was fuming. It's Plato and Matt Neal side by side. Then it kicks in, I am going to beat you, no matter what it takes. This is into the final corner now. Went down his inside, he did exactly the same again. Matt Neal sideways, he's off this time. Yeah, maybe I should have just rammed him off. We were both being naughty and I was determined I was going to, you know, be naughtier than he was and he came off worse. Oh well, we won the championship. We had another great one at uh, Snetterton. He brake checked me and caused me to just run into the back of him. Cheers. Oh. There's no mover on there. And of course, then he got past, that's why I fired him off at the hairpin. Bang, piles into the back of me. Plato's pushed him off. It's one touch for another touch. That's Jason's mantra, though. Whatever it takes. And there's no other way to describe it. They were just dodging car racing. It nearly came to blows, didn't it, at Rockingham a few years ago. They knew I was quick at, at rocking, and they tried to block me going out to start qualifying. And it didn't work, because I managed to get in front. I just repaid the favour. First corner, he just hit the brakes and sat on the apex. So he just wrecked your lap. And then we came back to the pits, and their little plan had failed. And mine had succeeded, so, you know, he got the finger. It would have died down a bit once we got in the pits, but then he just did one more thing, which lit the blue touch paper. I'm going to rip it. Face off. You know what that? I can't rip it. I'll tear your face off. Yeah, something like that. I would have done as well, if I could get hold of him. Be careful, Jason. Be careful. Be careful, son. He'll do anything to get under your skin. Any tactic. Any tactic to win. He couldn't punch his way out of a paper bag. <laughs> I will count this by saying, over recent years, I've enjoyed much better racing with, with um, Matt. Jason is um, fanatical about his results. I know it'll be under his skin that I've got three championships and he's got two. And, he, you know, he could get another one, but um, he can't take those three off me. The motorsport maverick lives on. Hunt and Sheen would approve. We're allowed to be ourselves. Doing our debris from a paddling pool. It's fantastic, isn't it? I just want some ducks and a pina colada. I'll be right happy. Personally, I love them to let it all go. Of course, with coaching nowadays, young drivers particularly are very careful what they say. And with social media being the way it is, you know, you can be vilified instantly for saying the wrong thing. And they tend to think about what they say a little bit more than giving their reactions. But what engages the fans particularly, and us as viewers, is watching their reaction. It'd be boring if we were all just driving around around in circles, wouldn't it? That was Word of Sport as it happened. Now let's take a look at what can be done when you take a film of an event, cut it up and set it to music. I think it does breed mavericks. I think it gives people a platform to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. I drove a truck when I was 17 and 18. And they asked me if I wanted to have a go, and I said, sure, yeah, it's right up my alley. Truck racing, motorbikes, what's next with Barry Sheen? Uh, I don't know. Got any ideas? The day I can't race anything, is it worth being here? I think people should have a choice for what they do in life instead of being told what they do. That's where the difference is. These guys go in, and they've made the choices. They're quite happy to go and try and achieve great things, knowing that there's a risk that sits alongside them whether it's on two wheels, four wheels, mud, tarmac. The Mavericks, I think, probably were more common in the old days because you could get away with that sort of stuff. Nowadays, with social media and very big corporate sponsors plastered all over the driver's overalls, it's a bit more difficult to be a Maverick. Because of their charisma, because of their personalities, because of their achievements, multiplied by the fact that 
the like of them doesn't exist now. I'm sorry, I haven't... I have, I, can I stop there? <laughs> there is no James Hunt equivalent in Formula One now, or anywhere near it. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? They're the Mavericks. They're the people who define the word. And they only come along now and again. Um, we're only lucky that we've been around to see them. We haven't lost your touch, Brian. <laughs> I hope to get more in a chat than I have been with Barry Sheen when we got stopped and the cop put his head through the window and said, who do you think you are, Barry? Oh, it is you.